Thank you for joining us as we explore LibGuides, hosting, curating, creating, and adapting open educational materials. Today's presentation will follow this basic format, a brief introduction of the team, examples of specific case studies highlighting different designs of OER and affordable course materials in LibGuides. These case studies will be followed by a round-robin discussion between the four team members illustrating different themes that emerged for each project and in general. And finally, you will have link access to these and additional resources to help you should you decide to utilize LibGuides as a hosting platform for OER at your own institution. Let's introduce our team of librarians. Nikki cannon retch and Jeffrey Mortimer are Research Services and Discovery Services librarians, respectively, with Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. Nikki will be detailing a collaboration between the library and a team of chemistry faculty developing their first OER. Jeffrey will chime in later with some pros and cons of the LibGuides platform in this work. Susanna Smith is a librarian and instructional designer with Georgia Highlands University. She will be detailing their amazing collaboration with faculty to develop an OER library resources repository for English 1101 and 1102. And Katie Shepard is a web services librarian with Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. However, today she will be discussing work from her previous institution, East Georgia State College, and their collaboration with history faculty. Now let's explore some awesome creations. So I am Nikki Retch, and as stated in the intro, I work as a research services librarian at Georgia Southern University. I'm the liaison for the College of Science and Mathematics, but I am also the library champion for the USG Affordable Learning Georgia initiative. This initiative was started in 2014 to provide funding to faculty willing to overhaul an existing course to utilize OER course materials and or subscription-based materials already available through the institution's library. This particular partnership will showcase the work of a team of chemistry faculty who teach a specialized chemistry course for engineering majors. All engineering majors are required to take this course, and it is an intense overview of general chemistry compressed into a single semester rather than the two semesters provided to traditional intro chemistry courses. Our chemistry faculty were a little apprehensive about their ability to tackle this project, and so they had a list of requirements in choosing materials and the platform. They quickly chose the OpenStax chemistry text to adapt and modify. However, one of their biggest concerns, beyond affordability, was lack of student engagement in the current course materials. They felt engineering students had a difficult time relating the material to their major and career goals. Our chemists wanted to introduce new text, examples, images, video, and problem sets that would relate to engineering areas and engage these students in the material. They needed something with a low learning curve as time is always a factor for faculty. It also needed to be easily editable by them and possibly additional instructors as the course rotates with who teaches it from semester to semester. They needed a flexible platform that would allow them to change out images, add links, embed video, etc. And of course, it needed to be compatible with our LMS system. Everything also needed to be accessible, both to the students, the faculty, and also to meet requirements for the Affordable Learning Georgia Textbook Transformation Grant. They also wanted something that would help them keep track of data, usage stats, and other analytics to help them compare and justify the work they were doing. After several discussions, they decided to try LibGuides. They had used LibGuides as a course material platform in a faculty learning community the previous semester, and they knew that we used LibGuides with students on a regular basis. LibGuides allowed us to brand the materials to look and feel like Georgia Southern. The group maintained the feel and flow of a traditional text, so it would not feel too different for students, but the LibGuides easily allows all of the extras they wanted to provide, such as additional video right in the text, links out to documents that are important, problem sets, and new images and figures that help students make the connection between this material and engineering. Each chapter includes end-of-chapter questions embedded in the guide and also available as a PDF download if students want to print them out. Because LibGuides creates a unique URL for every page, every box, etc., the faculty were able to add direct links to relevant materials, 
chapters, and questions in their PowerPoint slides, in their lecture notes, and also on the departmental webpage. This allowed them to help students know which material would be covered before each lecture, and also provide students with the exact areas they needed to study before each exam. It also served as a great reminder for them, and it made going back over material easy for the students. While there were some challenges in using LibGuides, overall the faculty and students were very pleased with the materials. Here are some highlights from the faculty's final report to ALG. Their ultimate goal of creating more engaging and relevant materials for the students was a success with a 25% increase in students stating the examples related to their major and career goals. They saw a 23% increase in students stating they felt the course materials were related to successfully navigating the course. In other words, you actually needed to use these materials to do well in the class. 100% of the students in the course had access to the materials from day one and reported using the materials at least once. Prior to this, over 14% of students never bothered to purchase the text at all and the percentage of students who reported using the text to help them actually understand the materials went up by 39 percent. Additionally, faculty reported that the quick and drastic pivot from face-to-face -to, -face to complete remote teaching was a breeze with this material available in LibGuide. There was zero interruption for the faculty or the students accessing their course materials once COVID forced us to close down in March. Future plans for this material includes the faculty wanting to invest their time in creating their own tutorials to embed into the materials, encouraging students to suggest and or create problem sets and examples to keep the materials relevant to the field, making certain that the materials are easily accessible to other faculty members who may want to adapt portions for their own coursework and solidifying a plan and workflow for updating and maintaining the guide itself. This will probably include librarians as well as the faculty members. Thank you for engaging with us, and now Susanna will discuss her work at Georgia Highlands. Hello. As Nikki said, I'm Susanna Smith. I'm a librarian and instructional designer at Georgia Highlands College. First, just a little bit about GHC. We're primarily a two-year access institution, with about 5,000 students across six locations. Because we're so spread out, it's critical that shared faculty resources are web-based. And that's how this English 1101 course materials project got started. In 2015, a couple of English faculty approached me, looking for a way to share Galileo links outside of our course management system. After some back and forth discussion about various tools and free website creation platforms, we settled on using LibGuides. We created a very basic link-filled LibGuide, and they shared that with other folks in the department. Over time, more and more faculty asked for additional materials to be included. This happened at about the same time that GHC became heavily involved with Affordable Learning Georgia. So we decided to turn this into an open ed resource. And although we didn't get a grant, we moved forward with creating a repository of all kinds of 1101 resources. Ultimately, the goal was to move away from the pricey Norton anthology textbooks and curate our own collection instead. So how did we get there? There were a few things we had to make decisions about right away. The first was, did we want to make this student-facing, where faculty sent students to the guide to find the readings or lesson materials, or faculty-facing, where a faculty member could just grab the links and drop them into D2L. Ultimately, we decided it would be much easier for students if the material was all in one place, in their D2L course, with nothing extraneous to have to filter through. Our next decision was about look and feel. And we actually didn't spend much time on this, and I think that has caused a problem, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we needed to decide who would be able to add materials. Ultimately, we decided that I would be the primary editor, backed up by two faculty members. This kind of eliminates that kind of wild west of links being added. Any faculty member could request materials be added, with the preference being Galileo resources and sources found on the open web. Another reason that it was good to have the librarian be kind of the, the main editor is that I could pay attention to copyright. 
I could ask for permission when we weren't sure about it, and I could make sure that the copyright law was followed to keep ourselves safe. Our other decision included what we wanted to include on the site. We really wanted to make it a one-stop shop, especially for adjuncts and new faculty. It would include resources from across the curriculum. Of course, reading and online textbooks would be the primary focus, but we also decided we wanted to include links to favorite teaching tools, information about rhetorical modes and grammar resources in the writing process. Faculty won't have to use all of them, but they could pick and choose and decide what they like to use the best. And finally, as a librarian, of course I wanted to include library tools, and so we have materials on search tips and citation helps and other things like that. These additions meant that a faculty member could build a lesson plan and not have to go questing for resources. It's all here in one place. So I mentioned look and feel earlier. This year, we're planning a big redesign of the site, mainly in look and feel. We're not changing the content very much. And this is our goal. This is our dream of what we want it to look like. A couple of years after the 1101 project got off the ground, we decided to do the same thing for English 1102 and developed a much lovelier site, if I do say so myself. So we want to pare down some of the materials on the 1101 site and give it a much cleaner and elegant look. I think we'll be combining some pages, removing some of the ad-like bling, which takes up a lot of space, and we're also going to review all the major website-based content to determine if we want to keep, add, or remove anything. So that leads me to lessons learned. So these are my takeaways based on kind of us doing it the hard way. Think about what you want before you start building it. Plan the end product through as best you can and decide what you need and who will see it. I think the 1101 site would have looked a lot different had we decided to make it student facing. Don't do this without having backing and buy-in. You know, don't just say, I'm going to develop this and people will use it. It's not an if we build it, they will come situation. We got started with just two faculty using it, but now nearly all 1101 courses are using materials, at least as supplemental, because we got input and everybody had a voice. This would have been a hugely disappointing project otherwise. And finally, prepare for the next iteration. This won't stay static. It shouldn't stay static. Have a series of checks and balances planned so that nothing gets out of date or obsolete and make sure that you're reviewing it often and frequently. So that's just a little bit about the 1101 project at Georgia Highlands. Thanks. Hi, I'm Katie Shepard, Web Services Librarian at Mercer University. Previously, I was the librarian at East Georgia State College. EGSC is primarily a two-year associate's degree granting institution of about 3,000 students across three locations. During my time at EGSC, I worked with Dr. D. McKinney, Professor of History, to develop course materials for the two Western Civilization Survey courses with the assistance of two Affordable Learning Georgia grants. We chose to host these texts in LibGuides. I first started collaborating with Dr. McKinney under our Embedded Librarian program. Dr. McKinney had already been exploring other pedagogical approaches to online course design and had been supplementing her courses and textbooks with open materials. We thought it would be a good idea to apply for an ALG grant and completely transfer transform the course. We applied for and were awarded our first grant for History 1111 Western Civilization until 1648 and Round 6 in Spring 2016. We developed the course during that fall, then implemented and revised the materials for three semesters. We also applied for and were awarded a second grant in Round 11 in Spring 2018 for History 1112 Western Civilization since 1648 using the same techniques. By transforming both rounds, a student can complete the entire Western Civ survey in an online class form without having to purchase any textbooks. My main focus when wrapping up the first grant was making sure that this new text is as shareable and usable as possible. Since these courses were online courses, there was not a physical or digital textbook. We built the content right into the LMS or the Learning Management System. The grant required that the materials be listed and available in the link syllabus and final report, but I wanted a more usable option. Since I am quite familiar with LibGuides and regularly built guides, I decided to use this platform for several reasons. I wanted to find a way for other faculty to download the documents and materials and put them directly into their LMSs, or to be able to copy the LibGuide to their own lab library's LibGuide system, or possibly even link directly to the LibGuide if they wanted to use the course as is. I was also comfortable adding and embedding the various resources and organizing it exactly as I wanted. 
LibGuide makes the material LibGuides makes the material look cleaner and more approachable with white space for the eye to rest, which makes using the text easier for all types of users. When deciding how to design the LibGuide, I chose to emulate the syllabus of the project and organize it more like a traditional textbook. I wanted the design to be easy to understand for potential implementers and to work like a textbook for students who are primarily online or not used to having a course without a traditional print textbook. The LibGuide is organized with left-hand navigation. The home page includes the overview of the project, an explanation of ALG, a brief overview of the textbook and the unit setups, links to download all documents needed to implement this text, including a linked syllabus, dis discussion questions, and a complete talk copy of the text as documents. We decided to apply the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike License to our materials. The courses are designed in units, 12 for History 1111 and 7 for History 1112. Each unit features a variety of sources of content to engage the learner, a short and written introduction to the broad, broader concept or time period, a YouTube video or videos for background information, most often a crash, crash course or history summarized video, which helps students understand the context and basic details of a time period, as well as a quiz for the student to test their understanding, several primary sources, and a narrated PowerPoint for students. Dr. McKinney created the narrated PowerPoints and I turned them into videos and uploaded um, them to YouTube. She also wrote the brief introductions. The primary sources were gathered from a variety of sources, but a large number were from the Internet History Source Books Project from Fordham University. The crash course videos are from a project started by the authors and brothers John and Hank Green as a way to present history and other academic subjects in an interesting and approachable way. These proved to be one of the more engaging parts of the course content, according to student feedback. Additionally, there were discussion questions for the students to answer in the LMS and some optional links for further, further exploration. All materials were free and openly available materials. There were no supplemental textbooks, so the course cost was $0. As I was building the LibGuide, um, Dr. McKinney was the content expert, so my focus was on building the LibGuide to host the materials for others instructors to use and also to function as an embedded librarian. In my role as the embedded librarian, I also created a course guide in LibGuides for both courses. It covered a few library specific topics such as primary and secondary sources, especially important with how often we use primary sources, and a video tutorial on how to think critically about history by using by asking questions about text that you've read. This video was especially helpful when students had trouble synthesizing content to answer some more complex discussion questions. I also created and monitored a discussion thread in the online course for students to ask relate, research related questions to or functional access questions. I assisted Dr. McKinney with technical support such as upkeep of the links to the primary sources. After implementing both courses, we were able to continue using the text through spring 2019 when we both accepted positions at other institutions. In total, we estimate that students save $60,000 in textbook costs over the length of the project. After completing these two projects and implementing them over several semesters, I learned several things about hosting OER content in LibGuides. I still think that using LibGuides is a great choice for this content. LibGuides is an easy to edit platform that's good for maintaining content beyond a project. Because the platform is still being actively used at EGSC by the librarians there, the platform still has experts to update the content and it also means that the text can be re-implemented with minor changes at EGSC or other institutions. Sometimes websites change their URLs mid-semester. During the last two semesters using the text, Fordham began moving their content to a new platform and half of the links broke, the other half went obsolete a link at a time during the semester. So it's important to test the links and also use the add link type in LibGuides instead of adding it to the rich text HTML box because the LibGuides built-in link checker only checks those assets added as links. As a result, the current librarians at EGSC have had to replace some links individually, which is pretty work intensive. Using the link asset option makes it easier for the life of the digital creation. When designing LibGuides, keep your audience in mind. For our LibGuides, I designed with potential instructors in mind. All of the content needed to implement the text was there on the home page. While the LibGuide could be used by a student easily, I found that most professors we spoke to were interested in remixing and borrowing, not copying it exactly as is since our content has different types of resources. Lastly, organization is key. We found that in the beginning stages of implementation, students had lots of trouble understanding that the course content was the textbook and which materials belong to which unit. While this was discussed in the syllabus, 
In practice, we focused on making sure that the content was uniform by unit and clearly labeled. In my current position at Mercer as the Web Services Librarian, I've migrated the library onto the SpringShare platform, first by moving the subject guides that were hosted on the library website to LibGuides. While migrating, I also worked with research services librarians to consider a variety of resources to feature on their guides. Because Mercer is a private institution, we don't participate in Affordable Learning Georgia, but since beginning this position, I've been able to volunteer my experience to librarians about incorporating open access materials in their recommendations to patrons, as well as to speak with several faculty members about the available repositories, including the Galileo Open Learning Materials. Hi. I'm Jeff Mortimore, Discovery Services Librarian at Georgia Southern University. Before we move on to the team's round-robin discussion of lessons learned from these three case studies, I'll take a moment to review some of the pros and cons we experienced using LibGuides as an OER platform. As each case study shows, overall LibGuides is an effective tool for developing and delivering OER content. In Georgia Southern's case, I think it's fair to say LibGuides made the Chemistry of 1310 project possible. However, every content management system has benefits and drawbacks that need to be weighed before starting an OER project. To start, let's consider some of the pros of using LibGuides. First and foremost, for many of us, LibGuides is already paid for. At Georgia Southern, once we determined that LibGuides could host the Chemistry 1310 textbook effectively, there was no strong argument for incurring new subscription or development costs. Because we knew that LibGuides could do the job, this was one task we could check off our list early. Similarly, by adopting LibGuides, librarians are able to limit their dependence on third parties to maintain or troubleshoot the platform, be it Galileo or local IT. For many of us who work in LibGuides, we can troubleshoot issues ourselves or go straight to SpringShare when we need additional support. This cuts down on the time it takes to troubleshoot and fix things which is crucial when students and faculty are using OER content in real time. This is another way of saying LibGuides is a familiar platform. Librarians have years of experience creating and managing instructional content in LibGuides, so there is no strong argument to reinvent the wheel learning and developing a new platform if LibGuides can do the job. Also, LibGuides familiarity matters if you intend to engage faculty in managing content. In Georgia Southern's case, our plan was to have faculty updating textbook content on a regular basis, meaning that we needed to be comfortable teaching it and the faculty needed to be comfortable using it. LibGuides is similar enough to other content management systems, such as D2L, that the faculty were able to catch on quickly. Also, as pointed out in each of the case studies, LibGuides generally makes it easy to import, revise, and repurpose content over time and as curricular needs change. OER content may come from a variety of sources requiring different levels of manipulation, correction, or revision to use in the current project. In Georgia Southern's case, the bulk of the content the faculty wanted to use came as XML files from OpenStax, which required extensive batch processing prior to importing into LibGuides. Once we established our workflow, though, importing this content was relatively easy. Also, as any OER project matures, librarians and faculty may want to reorganize and externalize content, for example, by embedding it into the learning management system. LibGuides makes reorganizing pages, boxes, and assets relatively easy, as well as boxes include embed code that can be used to push content into D2L or other websites. Content management is further enhanced with SpringShare's link checker, asset management tools, and usage tracking tools. LibGuide's flexible permission and access controls are also important if faculty or students will be updating content. With permission and access controls, it's easy to cordon off OER projects from the library's other LibGuides while providing editorial access to the folks who need it. Finally, LibGuide's ability to support custom cascading style sheets and JavaScript libraries is crucial for style management and hosting unique content, especially in the sciences. For example, in Georgia Southern's case, our source XML files from OpenStax included numerous mathematical equations in the MathML XML standard, which needed to be displayed correctly to be accessible and usable by students. Our ability to link in the MathJax JavaScript library to display these equations made this possible. Now for some cons, or more charitably, some challenges we ran into that you should be aware of if you choose to use LibGuides for OER. 
These challenges won't affect every OER project, but may be especially important for projects that involve large amounts of imported content or unique content like Georgia Southern ran into with our MathML formatted equations. First, be aware that LibGuides enforces character limits on rich text HTML fields, which is a challenge when importing large chunks of HTML or XML. In Georgia Southern's case, some checks of HTML that we imported from OpenStax were well over 500,000 characters, which is too much to put in one rich text HTML field in LibGuides. Our solution was to stack multiple rich text HTML fields into a single box to minimize visible breaks while allowing us to apply custom CSS to the entire box. One solution that some content management systems support to work around this problem is the ability to display the content of an external HTML file by linking it uh, to your page. The ability to display external HTML is also helpful if you are likely to perform batch updates on those files that is more easily handled in software like Notepad++ or Dreamweaver. Unfortunately, Springshare currently does not support displaying linked HTML. While there may be ways to accomplish this using iframes or widget assets, Springshare supporting this natively would be best. I've asked Springshare to consider this as an enhancement, so maybe they'll develop it. Another challenge for managing large chunks of imported HTML is that currently there is no Find Replace tool built into LibGuide's Rich Text Editor or HTML Viewer. This would be helpful for batch revising HTML directly in LibGuides rather than having to perform these revisions in another program, then re-import the code. Also, one challenge when importing large chunks of HTML is LibGuide's tendency to auto-edit HTML when you click Save. While these auto-edits are important to LibGuides for maintaining consistent code, it can interfere with coding requirements unique to particular pages or content. In Georgia Southern's case, we avoided auto-edits to our HTML by using the HTML viewer only to edit rich text HTML fields impacted by this. The ability to link external HTML files could help here too. Finally, for projects that involve a lot of imported HTML and XML, tracking link usage in rich text HTML fields is a bit more involved than for link assets, as well as you cannot use LibGuide's link checker tool for these links. It would be helpful for Libgu if LibGuide's could work to improve support for both of these issues, and it's important to be aware of if tracking link usage is critical to your project. Again, every content management system has benefits and drawbacks that need to be weighed before starting an OER project. However, as our use cases show, the pros far outweighed the cons for hosting these projects on LibGuides. As each of our presenters have stressed, planning is key, especially when relying on imported content. Here are some important takeaways to have in mind when starting a new project. First, thoroughly vet any content you intend to import into LibGuides. Make sure you know how the content is structured and organized and how much work you'll have to do to import it successfully. Second, be sure to conduct proof of concept tests with the content you intend to import. You want to identify any issues with the content early so that you have time to research solutions and develop any needed workflows. Similarly, be sure to develop, document, and follow consistent import workflows so that the you know exactly how the content has been imported, and so troubleshooting is easier down the road. Of course, as you are importing content, you may discover that you need experts to help you with certain tasks. For example, in Georgia Southern's case, we needed experts able to revise mathematical equations in MathML format. Fortunately, in our case, our partner faculty knew how to do this using math editor tools in Microsoft Word. If they hadn't, the project may have ground to a halt. In short, be sure to identify and recruit the expertise you need early to make the project successful. Now that we've considered some of the pros and cons for using LibGuides, let's move on to the Teams round robin discussion. All right, so we've had an opportunity to, to work through a couple of case studies and talk about the pros and cons of uh, using LibGuides. So now we're going to transition to um, a round robin discussion of some questions that we're hoping will be of interest to you. They're certainly of interest to us. and. Um, uh, what I'll do is I'll just um, start with a question and invite Katie and Susanna and Nikki to, to talk about their experience. And uh, we'll give each question about four and a half minutes or so uh, to fill out our 45-minute presentation. So 
let's start with this question. given your experience, what advice do you have for planning oer ER projects using libguides? i think for us, um, my, my biggest thing about planning is make sure you know what content you want and how you want to have it organized before you ever put pen to paper, before you ever start creating the first page in a libguide because it's a lot easier to to have a draft and then to build it than to put a whole bunch of stuff up and then have to completely rearrange it, redo it, reorganize it, resort it. So that's my biggest tip on planning is make sure you've got it all planned out before you ever start building. Agreed, but if you're working with faculty in particular, and especially with ours, um, we were allowing faculty to be creators, prepare to have to still go back and redo some things because they will change their minds once they see those initial layouts and other things will come to their mind about what they want and things of that nature. So you still have to be flexible even with your planning, I think. Oh, absolutely. I think uh, another thing to keep in mind is um, that since these are digital objects that we're trying to plan for longevity as much as a digital object can be uh, maintained that way. Um, I also think it's important to remember accessibility. Uh, it's best to plan with accessibility in mind than to go backwards. Um, so making sure that there are uh, that the libguide is accessible to all users, <clears throat> all text for images, things like that for sure. Yeah, you want to use kind of the same accessibility planning that you would for any course. The fact that it's in a libguide should make no difference than that. So just as you would if you were putting it in D2L or your LMS, you need to plan for that from the very beginning. Agreed, Katie. Yeah, exactly. And, and in my experience, I, I don't know about you guys, but you know, very often the librarian has to take the lead on helping faculty understand what needs to be done to achieve accessibility. Um, it's, it's definitely a role for the librarian to, to provide guidance on that just as you do with copyright. Exactly. Or Yes, or another entity on your campus, Any, I know you have instructional design background, Susanna. Some yes. librarians may not, but we did partner with our Center for Teaching and Excellence and worked specifically with folks with an instructional design background. That's huge. If you, can, if you have someone who's got kind of a pedagogical lay, uh, background, that having, having that in the planning stage would be just hugely beneficial. And understand that this may be incredibly new for many of your faculty. So many of them are used to simply taking that proprietary textbook and using all of the, and you know, other materials from that book, and they don't really put a lot of planning into their actual course design. If you're creating in this manner, that really is paramount to the success of the course. All right, great. Well, um, how about if we move on to our next question? What are some things that came up that you didn't expect? Um, for me, some of it was limitations in LibGuides that we didn't even know existed up until the point of trying this, such as a character limit. Um, obviously, with the LibGuides we had created for library instruction and other things, we had never come close to that character limit. But dumping the content for a full text chapter kind of pushed the system in ways we didn't expect. And, and for us, that, that had a lot to do with um, how OpenStax had prepared the pages that we were importing. As I described earlier, they used um, MathML XML format to uh, um, encode the, uh, the mathematical equations. It takes a lot of characters to write all that XML. and. Uh, um, as Nikki's describing, we didn't know that there was a character limit on these boxes until we tried to import some of that text. So again, anytime you're going to be um, utilizing somebody else's content, it's important to do those proof of concept tests er in the early going so that if you run into any roadblocks with the platform, this is true not just for LibGuides, but for any content management system that you can, you can uh, figure out how to work around those limitations. This is probably most likely a challenge for, for imported content, um, maybe less so for you know, content that's being created locally. I found that the content in our look guides um, 
when I started loading it in previously when we designed our um, our textbook, it was used in D2L, which looked a little different. So when I moved it into LibGuides, I realized some of the pages did get a bit lengthy and the organization structure was a bit different. Um, so I worked really hard to make sure that there were ways to navigate within the LibGuide. Um, so I thought it would be a direct move from D2L into LibGuides. We did take some design thinking about making it usable for faculty and we want it to be pretty attractive, but also if someone did want to implement our content and use it and allow students to use it directly from a LibGuide um, that they would also be able to find things. So definitely was not expecting when I move the content to have to um, rethink it a bit. For me, our because our LibGuide is more of a repository than like a single course, I was really not expecting so many faculty to email me at random times during the semester and say, oh, can you add this to that? Can you put this on there? which is fine, but I just, I wasn't expecting that much interest in kind of curating the content. I know my initial two faculty members certainly were very, very engaged, but I wasn't expecting the whole department to start suddenly saying, oh, we should put this, oh, we should do that. So that really surprised me. And kind of playing off of that, I was even more surprised at how many times I get emails from people asking, can I copy your guide? and use it for our school. And I would have to say, well, a lot of these links go to library resources that you won't be able to link to. And because that's okay. We just want the structure. And I'm like, sure, go for it. Just give us credit for the layout. <laughs> so that's why having the uh, Creative Commons license is really important too. That credits the brilliant work you did, Susanna, because I'm one of those. The second I find a faculty member willing to jump on this, we're, we're copying that guide. Well, it's going to look very different by the end of the semester. We'll talk about that next, though. <laughs> All right, very good. Let's uh, let's move on to the third question. Okay, so um, for our third and final question, what are your next steps? I suppose I should go first, since I just alluded to it. We're doing a complete redesign of the LibGuide. Um, getting rid of a lot of the boxes. It's, all the content's going to be there, but it's going to be a lot more streamlined. And it's going to be, I think, a lot more pretty to look at, which for some reason has been just this really important thing with, with my two uh, faculty partners is they're like, we really like the content, but we think it's just really ugly. And so I'm like, well, we can make it prettier. I've got a little bit more knowledge now in CSS than I did when I first built it. So I can play a little bit with the bootstrap and make it look more interesting. So that's going to be, it's going to be a big, big change. It is amazing how important those aesthetics really are to the faculty. It's not just about the content. They really do want to make it pretty and appealing. And it's even, this is not student facing. Uh -huh. So this is just, it's just pretty for them. And I'm like, well, okay, we can make it pretty. I'm all about making it pretty. I think somehow pretty equates to usability and ease of use for them. If it looks nice and it looks friendly, automatically in their mind they think it's going to be easier to get into and easier to navigate. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes also how it looks um, in the back of their mind um, convinces them that it's it's more reputable. I think that when something looks nicer people think oh well then it definitely has value. Um, I did a simple thing in our LibGuides and I just in Canva freely available I created some headers with just the lesson name and color coded it and it was a huge difference to me and I hope to other people who used it but even something small like that kind of brings it together. Yes um, since my group has um, pretty much revamped all of their PowerPoint slides and everything else to align with this text I would love to get them to actually place those in the LibGuide for the students somehow, is to add that to it so everything is all basically in one package and the students could access those slides anytime they wanted to. Oh, that's a great idea. We also have another group that wants to put theirs in LibGuide. So, um, it's like figuring out how to do this as you've done, Katie, with one that's already been created completely in D2L. And they're not really pleased with it in D2L. And they love the other one that their colleagues have created in LibGuide and want to transfer over. For sure. Um, next steps for me. Um, well, currently our LibGuides are being 
the libguides that we created for this uh, project are being maintained by the EGSC library staff. They've been really awesome about updating links, um, and I'm hopeful that um, someone will find the libguide and want to copy it um, and um, maybe re-implement it. I think it would be pretty easy to, um, sorry, I'm wrong. Um, I think it would be pretty easy to, um, for a professor and a librarian to sign on and then look at the content and then perhaps substitute some in and then re-implement it. So I have great hopes that uh, that the content will be useful in the future for sure. So let me, um, we've got a little more time, so let me just um, sort of tweak this question, what are your next steps, and, and ask more broadly. And, you know, especially in our, our, our present moment with COVID-19, um, are you thinking at all about how LibGuides could contribute to promotion of OER on your campus? And, and sort of what are your plans going for, uh, forward for promoting OER um, to faculty? And does LibGuides play a role in that? Our lovely group flat wrote in their final report to ALG how much having this available as an OER for one and also on this platform helped that immediate frantic pivot be very smooth for them. So it's nice to be able to pull some actual text and kind of plunk it in some marketing materials or in those slides when you're teaching other faculty and have something that has come straight from their own colleagues. At Highlands, we have five or six classes now that have their entire course content in a libguide. Um, outside of this English one that I've been talking about. And oh yeah, it's made just it was a huge, huge benefit because the student didn't have to learn something new. The faculty didn't have to learn something new. The content was all there. They didn't have to frantically worry about not having a physical textbook because they couldn't get to the library or the tutorial center or wherever. Um, and so, you know, Highlands has always been really strong about pushing OER. And I think that LibGuides become suddenly a really interesting platform to start putting the content into. Mercer, we uh, made a LibGuide when uh, we when we um, started working from home. We made a LibGuide for resources for faculty. Um, there aren't as many online classes at Mercer, and so it was a, it was a hard pivot for a lot of faculty. And uh, I worked with some of the research services faculty, and we included a lot of open resources because we found that that was kind of the time, I was a little self-serving, but to kind of slide in there that there are plenty of good resources that are open um, that really, I think, helped them pivot so that they were able to make uh, the classes work for their students, for sure. I think we all saw that. And even Affordable Learning Georgia mentioned that the downloads of materials from their own repository went through the roof as soon as COVID hit. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we've come to the end of our time. So um, Katie, Susanna, Nikki, thank you all very much for, for joining me in this conversation. And thanks to everyone who's um, uh, uh, watched our video. Um, we hope you found it useful. And please feel free to reach out to any of us if you have questions or need support in a project like this. Thank you all.